And thanks to all of you, and thank you for the invitation to be here today in this important event. I'm asking the question that I'm, I was given, why multidimensional poverty? I hope you have some inkling of an answer by the time the talk is over. Since it is a rather difficult question, so I'll provide one answer, and I could talk on chronic poverty and many other things, but this is the charge today. So traditional monetary poverty is a long-standing concept. I mean, I first looked at it in the work of Booth and Roundtree in England and reported it in a survey that I had wrote in 1984. There are official methods in many countries, and there are global methods, the main global method being World Bank's dollar twenty-five a day, which has, in fact, been in applied to measures of poverty that I've been involved in, the headcount ratio, the gap, and the squared gap measure, otherwise known as the FGT class. The World Bank's effort has been a colossal effort. A really remarkable collection of data points is out there now on monetary poverty. Hats off go to our colleague uh, Martin Revalian across the city in Georgetown. Now, if global monetary poverty were to disappear, in other words, fall below 3%, would this signal an end to poverty? That's a good question. Many voices, including those of the poor, would say no. That wouldn't be enough. In fact, there are many practical issues. I give you health insurance in the United States. Could we convert that to that important issue into a monetary measure? The answer is no. It's not converted. It's not even included in the discussions of poverty in the U.S. as measured by the monetary measure. Why not? Because if you took the value of insurance as given by Medicaid and looked at that value, incorporated it into the incomes of the poor people, they wouldn't be poor. It's a very high value for that insurance. So there are very practical issues that prevent us from including policy-relevant dimensions in the discussion. What about housing in developing countries where there's no housing market? India, for example, in the village. There's no way that there's a market for selling houses, so how do you know what the value of the house is? How do you value money over time and space? I was just speaking with someone in the audience who noticed that there are big problems in trying to understand what happens as time goes on and as prices, individual prices change, you have to then start weighting each price change by some number, that number being a quantity in a bundle or some other way of looking at a CPI or a PPP. This is a difficult issue. And finally, even if you've done everything right, you may actually be missing important dimensions of poverty in a particular country. And I bring as the main example poverty in India, which has been falling steadily for quite some time without even a budge in the malnourishment of children, staying pretty constant at 5%. So I wanted to give you another voice. This voice is someone you may recognize. Read through the first part and you'll notice that there is a suggestion of looking at the population from the point of view of the most deprived 40%. Does that sound familiar? Indeed it is. The lower 40% target, which is now part of the World Bank's dual or twin goals. But then this particular voice continues. But they must be prepared, countries, governments, must be prepared to give greater priority to establishing growth targets in terms of essential human needs in terms of nutrition, housing, health, literacy, and employment. And then he goes on. 
Such a reorientation of social and economic policy is primarily a political task. And the development, developing countries must decide for themselves if they wish to undertake it. So this is Robert McNamara in a very fine speech given in 1972, suggesting that we look at poverty more broadly than just income. And in fact, as he said, will countries have the will to move forward, to look in these other dimensions? Indeed, they are. They're deciding for themselves right now. Mexico, Bhutan, Colombia, Philippines, many countries have multidimensional poverty indices incorporating other crucial dimensions into the identification of the poor and into the measurement of poverty. This is a shared methodology that is coming with South-South technical support that I'll mention at the end through the multidimensional poverty peer network. So multidimensional poverty, I would argue, is a long-standing concept that it's implicit in the discussions of Booth and Roundtree. And in fact, it's an official method in several countries. And it's, com it's a complementary global method. The UNDP's multidimensional poverty index is a colossal joint effort by the HDRO and by OFI from Oxford. It has a remarkable collection of results over time and space. So hats off to HDRO, OFI, and company. So the discussion today will be why multidimensional poverty. I'll have a brief overview of unidimensional poverty, of multidimensional poverty, give some examples, and then some conclusions. Poverty measurement is traditionally seen as being identifying who the poor are, otherwise known as targeting the poor, and aggregation. How much poverty is there out there for evaluation and for the purposes of monitoring progress? Typically, it uses a poverty line for identification. You're poor if you're just below that poverty line or all the way down. For example, an income distribution of seven, three, four, eight. An example where the poverty line is five would have who as being poor? It would be the second and the third person who would be considered to be poor since their incomes are below the poverty line. It also uses a poverty measure for aggregation. A formula aggregates the data to the poverty level. For instance, Amartya Sen, Harold Watts have their own measures, and then the FGT measures we've talked about, which are defined as a mean of a particular vector. Oh, let's not talk about it that way. I'll give you an example. Here's an example. 7, 1, 4, 8, the one I just had, with a poverty line of 5. Who is poor? They're underlined in the vector. Person two, person three. The deprivation vector, or people who are regarded as poor, has a zero if you're not poor, or one if you're poor. Take the average, that m should be a mu for mean. The mean of that vector is two-fourths. That means the half of the people are considered to be poor. But let's suppose that you don't think that's a good enough way to measure, and most people don't that you should, in fact, take into account the gap below the poverty line in determining how much poverty there is. Then you might look at the normalized gap. In the case of the second person, 4, which is 5 minus 1, over the poverty line 5 is the normalized gap for person 2, 1 fifth for person 3, zeros for the other two. Take an average of that vector, and that is the poverty gap measure, as given in most poverty reports at the World Bank. Finally, we might square those gaps 
take the gap times the gap. It emphasizes the condition of the poorest poor. Why is that? Because the second person has now 16 times the value of the third. Before, it was only four times. If you take the average of that vector, you get the FGT squared gap measure of poverty. And these are very interesting and helpful tools for looking at monetary poverty. So how should we, with that in mind, evaluate poverty with many dimensions? The previous work before I started working in this area focused mainly on aggregation. How do you pool all that data to get a measure of poverty? Really, the interesting part is the identification step, because before they were only using one of two ways. Either you were considered poor if you had a deprivation in any dimension of the many dimensions being considered, the so-called union approach. Alternatively, you were poor if you were deprived in all dimensions. That would be the intersection approach. Both are quite impractical going from one extreme to the other. You need an intermediate approach that would then understand not at one extreme, not at the other extreme, but something in between that could help target the poor effectively. In 2011, Sabina Alkair and I wrote a paper which created a methodology that addressed these problems. It has an intermediate identification method and it's something which is consistent with the kinds of data you always get in multidimensional poverty, what I call ordinal data. Sanitation, for instance. How do you classify sanitation numerically or cardinally? It makes no sense. So in order to take into account these other dimensions that are often ordinal, you have to have a methodology that's consistent with that quality of data. Our methodology has a so-called dual cutoff approach to identifying who's, the, who's poor. Within each dimension of interest, a cutoff is established. You're deprived if you're below the cutoff. And then, as you aggregate all the different deprivations, you see that if you have enough breadth of multiple deprivations, you're considered to be poor. That poverty cutoff is some K. So a person is poor if they're multiply deprived enough. As an example, I give you these four dimensions. This is just a simple example with equal importance of each dimension. Imagine the first dimension is income in dollars a day. The poverty cutoff is 13, and we see who is deprived, person three with 12.5. The next dimension could be years of education, not a great measure of education, but it's what we have. And we see that if you have high school education requirement, 12 years in the US in this case, then the lower three people would be deprived in that dimension. The next column is self-reported health, starting at the lowest going to the highest with a cutoff of three, so the lowest two category make you deprived. Finally, whether you have a particular social service is given in the final column. Zero if you don't, one if you do, you're deprived if you don't. This is how we start out the exercise. Now we then try and understand how much deprivation people have. We count up in the case where we have the same weights on each dimension and see the first person has no deprivation, the second has two, the next one has four, and the final one has one. If our cutoff were two, in other words, you'd have to have two deprivations or more to be considered to be poor, then that bottom person is not poor and we ignore the deprivations of non-poor persons we're left with the so-called censored deprivation matrix to the right. So who is poor? Those middle two people in this case are considered to be poor. 
That's the identification. Now you can go on to actually consider other forms of measurement that take into account the depth of poverty. In, in each dimension, the depth of deprivation. But that requires cardinal data, which most measurement exercises simply don't have. But I wanted to give you the example of the entire class. It's exactly a generalization of the usual FGT approach to many dimensions. You take the mean of that censored matrix, whether it's the censored head count, the censored deprivation matrix, gap, or squared gap. We are going to focus on the adjusted headcount ratio, since it's the one that's practical, applicable, and used quite often. The adjusted headcount ratio can be calculated by looking at the mean or average of that matrix added up, one, two, three, four, five, six, over a total of, looks like, four times four, that's 16. Six over 16 is what we obtain as the adjusted headcount ratio. Another way of obtaining it is to look at the number of people who are poor out of the total. It's two out of four. So the headcount, H, is one half in this case. On average, what share of deprivations do the poor people have? One person has two out of four, the other has four out of four. On average, three out of four. Multiply those two together, and we see that the frequency times the intensity, H times A, is once again the same number, three-eighths, or what was six-sixteenths before. So this is the structure of the new technology for measuring multidimensional poverty. Now, just to have the overview, we identify with this dual cutoff approach, cutoffs in each dimension, and then overall. We aggregate using some kind of an FGT. The one we'll use is the headcount. Notice that everything generalizes from the single dimensions to the multiple dimensions, the natural generalization. The concept is poverty is multiple deprivations used by many NGOs. It depends on the entire joint distribution of all the data. It can work with ordinal data of the type dirt floors versus covered floors. Essentially, we're changing qualitative data into quantitative data. And it's very transparent once you've defined the variables, the deprivation cutoffs, the deprivation values, or the weights, and the poverty cutoff. You have everything. You can replicate it and, in fact, change it to test for robustness of the definitions. It has been implemented across country through the MPI, as I was mentioning before, within countries, within states here in Brazil. And it's now being used in many other types of measures. The Gross National Happiness Index of Bhutan is built on the framework. Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index of USAID is built on it. And there are service delivery performance measures that I'm now using in India. Let me now give you examples of this technology. This example is going to show you that the global MPI provides a very important headline for communication and monitoring, a number, a headline figure which then can be coordinated with an entire dashboard of indicators for policy analysis. So the global NPI, it's an internationally comparable index of acute poverty for 100 plus countries. It was launched in 2010 in the Human Development Report and has been updated every year since. The methodology is being adapted for national poverty contexts, which use better indicators for each policy context because the data globally is much less suited for <laughs> policy contexts than within countries. 
The data sources are well known, DHS, MIX, WHS, and a number of country-based surveys. Here's the picture of the MPI. Three dimensions, much like the Human Development Index. The dimensions are education, health, living standard. Inside the boxes there, you see that each one has equal value, each dimension does. But the indicators within the dimension themselves will have equal value within that particular dimension. So in education, there are two, so you have one sixth weight. Health, same thing. Standard of living, there's more dimensions, so therefore each has one eighteenth weight. All right? How do we construct an MPI, the MPI? We start with a deprivation score for each person, very similar to that score we had next to the matrix. Okay. So in this case, let's say we have only one dimension being satisfied, say living standards. The rest were deprived in. In fact, who is deprived in it? It's Natalie. Natalie's deprivation score is 67 percent deprivation. Of course, this is way beyond the cutoff of 33 percent, which is the cutoff underlying the MPI. So Natalie is considered to be poor. And then we compute the measure overall of poverty, as I showed you in the example. H times A is the MPI, where H is the incidence or the percentage of people who are poor, and A is the intensity, or the average percentage of dimensions in which poor people are deprived. It brings together two ways of measuring poverty. One, counting methods, two, axiomatic methods. And we can see all kinds of headline results. More intense poverty is given on the legend to the right. You can't see the figures, but I just want to have an overview for you. You get headline results comparing countries, making sense of what the picture is globally. But then you can dig in into the intensity or the headcount, the frequency. Which is it? Could be that a country that's exactly the same in terms of MPI has got higher percentage of the population who is poor, but they are less intensely poor. This is useful to know. The approach can be disaggregated by region. We see that state being disaggregated with its own similarly uh, indicated through the colors of levels of poverty. And within dimensions, we can see the extent to which deprivations occur on average among the poor. So we can see the composition or the origin of poverty by dimension. There's cooking fuel in this example, which is leading the way as being an important dimension of poverty. And you can do both, composition by region and dimensions. The bar graph is a simple way of indicating what is it that's making up the poverty in each separate region within the country. And over time, we can see, say, that Bangladesh improved school attendance, so that downward is, of course, better in this case in terms of deprivations. Ethiopia improved nutrition and water, whereas Ghana did many at the same time a rather different picture from each, with resulting evaluations of the policies rather different. So this is my co-author. My co-author would put this slide in because it gives you a real intense understanding of what the MPI is doing. It's providing a high resolution lens that, that you can zoom in on and see more. Why multidimensional poverty? Well, 
It's different from monetary po po poverty. The little black dots are $1.25 a day. MPI is the bar graph. I won't show you ex example countries because there's not much time. But you can see it's different. Also, in the case of Europe, we can see how the intersection here is very different than income poverty if we take into account not only income poverty, but material deprivation, joblessness. There are limited overlaps. Now two examples, national methodologies. Why would governments be interested in this? Because multidimensional poverty shows progress quickly and directly. You don't have to wait for 20 years until your policies show up in income. You can see them showing up in education, health, other dimensions you can directly impact. They can inform planning and focus the policy of a country in a coordinated way. They can target poor people and communities more effectively and can even go to the extent of reflecting poor persons' own understanding of poverty. Biju Rao at the World Bank has been discussing the participatory method and is in fact using this approach in villages in Tamil Nadu. The two examples are Mexico and Colombia. The example of Mexico is good governance in bad times. We can see from this graph that over the time period 2008 to 2010, Mexico suffered an increase in poverty, according to the multidimensional official measure that it's used. That measure is half income and half social dimensions, what they call social rights. In the social rights, we see that there has been improvement, social security, access to health care, basic services, etc. But over this time period of the crisis, there's an increase in income poverty that important component of their measure. People can look at this and say, ah, that's what's going on. Steadily, the policies are helping the social dimensions, but the cyclical nature is affecting the income poverty. Therefore, that figure of more people being poor makes sense. Colombia, coordinating action. Colombia's MPI, as they call it, MPI Colombia, has five dimensions. And I'll point out important policy dimensions. Work, which is formal, informal, very important dimension locally. And likewise, housing services are very important. So they were included directly in the measure. This is the picture of what happens every two months in Colombia. That's the president leaving, leaning over. There are the ministers. There is a discussion of the figures as they've come out that two-month period. Targets are set, people are held accountable, and poverty falls in a coordination, coordinated fashion across the silos of government. So I've presented to you two measurement technologies. There are two forms of technologies for evaluating poverty, for identifying and for aggregating. The first, unidimensional methods, they apply when you have either a single welfare variable, like in my first paper in Econometrica on poverty, we use calories. Or when variables can be combined in a reasonable way to get an aggregate variable, such as expenditure or even income, combining income from different sources or different types. When that can happen, unidimensional me methods can be used, and we're done. On the other hand, multidimensional methods apply when variables cannot be meaningfully aggregated. For instance, how do you aggregate sanitation conditions and years of education? Also, it may be the case that you would like to leave variables disaggregated because sub are policy relevant. So for instance, food and non-food consumption may have independent interest. Even if you could aggregate, maybe for policy reasons, you don't want to. So what's the role of 
the concept of multidimensional poverty as we move to a world without poverty. It presents a complementary picture of poverty. It includes other key non-monetary dimensions of poverty. It's a policy-relevant tool. The dimensions can embody the country-specific priorities and policies. You can show po the progress in a very quick way. You don't have to wait till your government's out of power, which is the bad aspect of certain types of measures of poverty that don't react quick enough to policies. You can target poor people and communities very effectively, and it can reflect the poor person's own understandings of poverty. The approach facilitates an understanding of poverty, no matter how you define it. The HA really does convey information. The decompositions by subgroup convey relevant information that's been the hallmark of what's done at the World Bank. The breakdown by dimension, that's new, and that's quite helpful for policy. And it can monitor changes over time and space. I just wanted to mention that the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network was launched in 2013 at the University of Oxford with President Santos of Colombia, a number of ministers, a lecture by Amartya Sen. The second meeting was held in Berlin in 2014. I wonder who that is. <laughs> Paolo. The MPPN has grown as of November 2014, over 30 countries, 10 multilateral body, bodies, including yours, circulated draft survey modules for a kind of new MPI for the post-2015 discussion. There's been a side event at UNGA, the General Assembly. There will be a side event at the Statistics Commission. It indicates this is a way to talk to other countries and other people interested in poverty. So, the goal is a world without poverty. A world without poverty, however it's measured. I thank you very much.